Perfect. Thanks so much, Kat. So we're going to move on with our afternoon component of, of, our, uh, of our webinar today. And uh, I'm super excited today to have the opportunity to moderate our panel uh, and hear different perspectives on the challenges of stormwater capture and use. Uh, we have a long list of panelists today. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to be briefly introducing each panelist and, uh, and asking one question. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and mix our agenda up just a little bit because we have somebody that needs to, to step off and we're running a little bit behind. So I'm going to start with uh, Jack Munger today. Jack Munger is the CEO of the Industrial Environmental Association. And Jack, we know that you advocate for using stormwater as a resource in our dry region. Um, how can San Diego businesses be part of the SCU solution and what funding challenges do you foresee? Well, thanks, Tama. Um, and thanks for the invitation to be here today. The panel and, and the uh, presentations preceding me have been extremely impressive. Um, the, the presentation from 3R Water and it, which was a, an excellent example of practical usage was, uh, was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more with what we've heard up from beginning with uh, Dave Gibson on, and that is that it, it is time to start treating stormwater as a resource in San Diego. Um, it's a problem that's been swept under the rug for a couple of decades, and I really commend uh, San Diego City staff for bringing this discussion up in front of the City Council and the public. Um, the key question from business is how do we implement a, a funding program that's not overly burdensome to residents and to uh, commercial and industrial proper, property owners? So I think uh, for maybe once, uh, what we need to do is look to the north uh, and to what Los Angeles has accomplished through Measure W and how they accomplished what they did and how they built an incredibly effective coalition. Um, and uh, there's just so many lessons there to learn uh, it's a, a great success story, um, but what we can't do is move forward with funding proposals that would be um, overly burdensome to either the residents or to um, industry. And I would give you one example for ex that uh, um, is being discussed, and that's basing a, a, a new fee on impermeable surface. Um, and the fee would be something on the order of four to five cents uh, per square foot of impermeable surface for example a, a, a large private property owner or facility whatever um, to put that into perspective for you many i think are aware of the solar turbines facility at harbor drive uh, downtown uh, right next to the airport and if this new fee were imposed solar turbines which is pretty much exclusively impermeable surface would be hit with a new annual fee of, of between $43,000 and $55,000 a year. Um, that, is, that is not the right way to go about, I think, spreading um, costs in an equitable fashion. And even a smaller little five acre strip mall with just a couple of shops and a, and a, and a car wash on it would be looking at something uh, on the order of nine to $11,000 a year in fees. So the question is, um, how do we do this? It's, it's got to be balanced. It's got to be fair. Um, but one of the things is how can industry be, to answer your question, how can industry be part of the solution? Um, and uh, I would suggest that one of the best ways, we've, we've heard about on-site usage of uh, storing rainwater. And one of the best ways for a lot of businesses um, would be to develop an incentivized program that encourages facilities to capture stormwater, and then uh, prepare it for metering into the city's sanitary sewer system um, for, for use, for example, in our own pure water program, which, which does not have a steady flow of water uh, throughout the year because of our, our, uh, uh, the way we, we, our rainy season and, and the dry seasons that we have with no, nothing running through uh, um, any, any sort of uh, storm drain. So, this would be, I think, a huge advantage. Um, many facilities that will be capturing and storing um, runoff and preventing runoff from their property could then be um, allowed to put it into the city stormwater system where it could be treated through the pure water program. And then we have a much more reliable supply um, of water for that system. Um, I, I think that would be an example of how 
um, businesses and industry, particular, particularly large facility owners, could play a major role in supporting uh, this program. So um, again, as with Measure W, uh, I think it's extremely important that whatever plan goes forward, it's coordinated with numerous stakeholders and on residents and businesses, um, because that's the approach that San Diego is going to need uh, to develop uh, the community momentum, if you will, to support, support a program like this. So um, thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts and, and, and actually thank you for the opportunity for bumping me up in the schedule. I've got a minor emergency that I need to run to here in a couple of minutes, um, but I, I appreciate hearing from everyone and I appreciate the commitment and energy that's behind this um, and that the Water Tech Alliance is made very visible to everyone. Uh, is behind this uh, this this need, um, and hopefully will lead to some solutions solutions for San Diego. Thanks, Jack. We appreciate you being here today and uh, and your insight. Thanks so much. Uh, moving on with our next panelist today, uh, we've heard from her, Stephanie Gaines, our coordinator for the C County of San Diego Watershed Protection Program. Stephanie, are you aware of any California state level regulatory changes? and new policies that are promoting stormwater harvesting, treatment, and use? That is a great question. Um, I will say that um, we kind of posed this question at our recent CASQA uh, conference last year um, in the fall, and um, we were lucky enough to host a panel on uh, stormwater harvesting and, and some of these types of issues, you know, regulatory trends and changes. Um, Dave Smith from EPA happened to be one of our panel members and he mentioned that EPA is working on promoting stormwater and capture and use at their level, um, particularly from the perspective that he said he understands the siloed natures of current municipal stormwater permits or various permits um, and the need to bring in public private partnerships into the mix to help move um, stormwater harvesting forward. Uh, also, we at the local level at the state, we have um, our storms unit, which is our it's it's a work group within the state water resources control board. Um, it stands for strategy to optimize resource management of stormwater in case anybody didn't know what the acronym storms stood for. Um, and they're looking at a variety of different projects, including dry well standards, um, which could uh, help with guidance on, on you know, capturing uh, stormwater for, as related to dry wells, um, stormwater volume methodologies, um, some adaptive management guidance. And they're also working on a stormwater uh, capture water rights fact sheet that could help uh, support um, some of these regulatory trends. Um, all, otherwise, at the local level, we get our municipal stormwater permits. And of course, in the San Diego region, um, we have language in our permit that indicates that we must um, effectively eliminate dry weather flows. So we work um, with members of the public to implement strategies that would help them <laughs> be successful in that venue. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, next up on our panel is Matt O'Malley, Executive Director of the San Diego Coast Keeper. Matt, what types of stormwater capture and use projects does the San Diego County Coast Keeper advocate for, and what are the outcomes you'd like to see in this space? Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, you know, as, a, as an organization, we're, we're quite aligned with many of the same goals and desires uh, that were mentioned by Dave Gibson and, 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 and then are of interest to the water board. And so we, we're very aligned sort of with, with those objectives. I think our advocacy in this arena really focuses on a, a sort of one water approach, very holistic approach to stormwater capture and management. Really the main outcomes we're looking at are clean water and clean water act compliance. That's a huge thing for us. Um, building climate resilience and water independence, improving environmental and public health, uh, and advancing equity uh, in this space. And so we're interested in really a diverse array of implementation, much of which was touched on today. It, it includes decentralized green infrastructure and green spaces, uh, while also providing the multiple benefits of flood abatement, uh, water supply augmentation, uh, obviously reducing polluter runoff, to also the larger, more centralized solutions, such as the pure water. And so decentralized things, such as um, a couple of years ago, Groundwork San Diego Choice had a great program where they installed large cisterns and green infrastructure throughout neighborhoods in the Choice Creek region, by, thereby reducing runoff, reducing water bills for folks, um, and providing more green space in the community. Uh, the airport, Dave mentioned that the airport, large capture devices for on-site use, extremely important, um, especially given the pollutants and the location you know, near the San Diego Bay. 
Um, you have your schools and parking lots. Again, he mentioned as great opportunities for e whether large scale projects or incubators moving forward. And certainly in our Clean Water Act enforcement cases, we do our best to attempt to prioritize capture and use on site where uh, it makes sense for, the, for that industry or municipality. And then the centralized is sort of a no brainer. You know, we have an agreement with the city of San Diego for implementation of the Pure Water um, project and would love to incorporate as much as possible, whether it's dry weather flow diversions or even wet weather um, diversions, Jack Monger mentioned maybe capturing and metering out into that program uh, additional flows. I think this is going to be necessary moving forward to, to again, achieve the water quality standards to build climate resilience and really address equity. Uh, I also say, you know, we also are quite uh, busy advocating around the funding for the capital and O&M. Um, I really appreciate the 3R, um, you know, presentation and, and, and what was being done there in, in, in Oahu. Uh, and uh, just think that there's so much opportunity here for uh, keeping to advance uh, these projects here. So I, I guess the answer is sort of uh, any and all of the above where it makes sense, where it's feasible. And, and we certainly do agree once you start looking at the cost of this water and the co-benefits, uh, it does. It would pencil out because of of really, uh, you know, the, the the negatives that are that we're facing now with climate drought, uh, you know, unhealthy waterways and, and pollutants uh, and and communities. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Great information. I had no idea that we were doing so much around capturing in San Diego with the with the cisterns. Uh, great information. Um, next up is Scott Taylor, who we heard from earlier uh, with Michael Baker International and chair of the National Municipal Stormwater Association. Scott, what is the best way to create storage in urban areas to capture and use stormwater for use in a direct potable reuse system? Thanks a lot, Emma. Uh, I'm going to be pretty brief because I think Stephanie Gaines did a great job of answering this question, but um, the low hanging fruit is really um, publicly owned parcels like parks. Um, if you can get a park that is near a storm drain system where you can divert water off into the park and then have other um, utilities, sewer and storm drain to plummet back into the system after you store it for a while, that's by far and away the cheapest because you don't have to pay for land. Um, most of the, again, the piping is already in place. Um, I think Dave Gibson mentioned parking lots, which I think are another good um, potential. Again, the public has to be sort of re-educated that they're gonna lose mm -hmm. the benefit of parks for a couple days or potentially parking lots, but um, it's relatively cheap storage in the urban environment. We're investing a lot, as you've heard today, in green infrastructure. And so that's really my third big one is we're gonna have this distributed system of green infrastructure across the landscape and those are going to be a pretty robust and resilient system that we can use to temporarily storm, storm water for a couple of days and then bleed it off into a system where it could go in for um, direct potable reuse. I mean, this is a big deal. This is really um, the most difficult part of the problem that we're trying to overcome is storing stormwater temporarily in an urban area for later reuse. It's going to take, um, some thought. It's going to take a lot of different ideas. I think we can get there, um, but we're going to have to, again, change how we um, pay for water mm -hmm. and, and change what the public's perception of it is. Unfortunately, in San Diego, you know, the other big one is really groundwater, groundwater recharge. Mm -hmm. As Stephanie again pointed out, we just don't have the big groundwater basins in San Diego that we can um, recharge like they do up in LA. Um, so that one's off the table. It's a pretty um, economical way to go, but um, we're going to have to be looking to these other um, resources that I just covered. So thanks. Thanks, Scott. Our next panelist is Carol Kim, Executive Director of the County of San Diego Building Trades and Construction Council. Carol, what types of stormwater capture and use projects does the San Diego Building Trades and Construction Council advocate for, and what are the outcomes you'd like to see in this space? Hi, Tama. Thank you so much for the question. And thanks to all of you for having me on this panel. I appreciate getting to be here. Um, so that's a it's a good question. And I, I want to note that um, 
recently at the city council, um, city of San Diego city council, there was a report on the infrastructure investment and jobs act that they just, that has just been passed by the, um, the federal government. And some of the dollars that are going to be coming down the pike for lots of these types of uh, opportunities for us. And specifically when it came to wastewater and water and wastewater opportunities, there was, um, they noted that there was $1.4 billion for sewer overflow and stormwater reuse municipal grants that states must carry out, but specific, but um, it particularly is directed and pinpointed at 25% um, of those projects have to happen in disadvantaged communities. So um, one of the things that we are really looking for is opportunities to make sure that we are doing public investment in some of our disadvantaged communities, the communities that have historically been overlooked and disinvested in, um, because those are the places where there are real um, serious intersections between both the lack of infrastructure um, public health outcomes that are not necessarily the best. And then, of course, as we're aware, because these are often low-income communities and communities of color, they are uh, areas that are just not as uh, the neighborhood beautification doesn't exist, the, um, the green spaces and open spaces and parks don't exist, those types of projects which allow for, um, for those communities to actually have very basic types of stormwater uh, infrastructure as you as you would think of it. Most of us don't think of those things. Uh, most of us meaning when I say us, I'm really talking about the average voter and uh, taxpayer. We don't think about parks and open spaces as infrastructure for stormwater, but as the rest of you know, that definitely is a part of it. So we really wanna see those types of public investments happening. And those are the kinds of pro uh, projects that we would be supportive of, as well as of course, the larger infrastructure projects that will require um, some serious investment and construction. And so as for those of you who um, aren't aware, the San Diego Building and Construction Trades Council um, I represent 30,000 plus um, uh, union construction workers. And so our organization is a, a, an umbrella organization for um, all of those unions. And so one of the things we really want to look at as we are moving towards some of this um, type of activity and investment is making sure that we're actually investing in our communities and our workers as we go forward. Um, a few of the previous speakers mentioned, like talked about the low ROI that we often see and the challenges and barriers at the sense of like low ROI and the high costs of stormwater um, infrastructure investments are barriers to some to us actually getting this work done. And so I really think it's a matter of perspective, right? The, I, I think that good quality jobs are a huge benefit to communities as is neighborhood beautification, increased public health outcomes um, and benefits. And then short, obviously for the rest, all of us to short and long-term water resilience for the region. Um, one, according to a report that was done by um, Lane in Los Angeles, like leading up to measure W's passage in 2018, um, Moody's Mark Zandi, that uh, reported that investing in infrastructure is among the more efficient job creation strategies, creating over 16% more jobs dollar for dollar um, than a payroll tax holiday, um, nearly 40% more jobs than across the board pay tax cut, and over five times as many jobs as temporary business tax cuts. So, and the sorts of positions that are created obviously for these types of uh, infrastructure projects are, uh, construction jobs, engineering and design jobs, public sector jobs, civic jo civil service jobs that are about operations and management, all of those things are jobs that actually lead to middle class family sustaining work that allows our communities to thrive and um, really gain more economic stability and um, regional sustainability. So I think all of these things are really important. Um, and then of course, you know, beyond job creation, these particular types of projects um, help to foster an industry. And we can actually do bring things like um, manufacturing for the various components, uh, whether they're cisterns or rain tanks or whatever they are to actually be done here in San Diego, which would again, also be a boost to our local economy. So when we talk about low ROI and we talk about high cost, we really should be reframing that discussion as we go forward, because we do need to actually generate the revenue to be able to do this. Um, and this is where labor groups like the San Diego Building Trades Unions can really be, can be and frankly should be an integral part of the efforts and initiatives that are um, coming up, uh, together around these particular issues. And frankly, in Los Angeles, Measure W's success had a large 
part to do with the coalition building that was done that included labor groups and community groups that are working towards equity. Um, and I just want to note, because I, I heard it mentioned in earlier, um, uh, some an earlier speaker mentioned, you know, I want to caution this convening against um, using language that co-ops the terms of equity for protecting the interests of large industry. I, I really think that it's it could be harmful to us as a whole in terms of what we're trying to achieve for the region. And I think we need to be aligned in defining and utilizing the concept of equity to mean that we're looking to invest in communities that have historically not been invested in. And so as a, as a community and as a group at, um, that's gonna be moving towards trying to really find sources to um, and invest in uh, stormwater infrastructure and systems here in San Diego, we really need to like have alignment and um, consistency in that. And uh, honestly, I think, you know, to differ, I'll say that I actually think that the impermeable uh, surface taxes are probably something that we need to take a really close look at in order to be able to really foster um, future opportunities for this particular matter. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. We can all see the opportunities and benefits of San Diego stormwater capture and use, yet there certainly are challenges too. And to address that today, Chris McFadden, the director of City of San Diego Stormwater Division. Chris, what do you see as the region's largest challenges to actually getting stormwater capture projects constructed? Good morning, and, and thank you for the question. And Stephanie, I think covered, she did a great job of really from the geology, what's the challenge? And for us, it comes down to largely cost and understanding of benefits. And if you look at the projects we, are, we have evaluated, we're moving forward with 14 potential locations for stormwater reuse in San Diego. That's about 8.6 million gallons per day. That's really exciting. We have two projects already in design. And really the one that Dave mentioned, Sorrento Valley is probably the best example of really getting it to pencil out. Because if you look at the cost of imported water versus the cost of stormwater reuse, it doesn't always pencil out if you're just looking at it from one perspective. But we're looking at it from all perspectives. So not only is it a source of potable water supply, but it's also keeping, keeping pollutants out of, uh, out of a, a really critical resource. And also it's cost avoidance for us not only do we manage uh, water, water quality projects, but we also have to manage a, an enormous flood resiliency projects. And this is keeping us from having to spend additional funding to, to do critical drainage maintenance, particularly in, in that area. So if we're able to look at the multiple benefits, um, and this also includes industrial users. Uh, Jack Monger brings up a very important um, issue needing to talk to the industrial users who will uh, potentially have to bear a lot of the costs along with everyone else living in, in the city of San Diego. Uh, and it's a fact that we haven't increased our storm drain fee since 1996 in, in San Diego. Uh, and we really do have to have a robust conversation. At the city, we've been leaning into this more than ever. Um, we are taking forward to our, our environment, environment committee February 17th a really robust path forward to a realistic funding strategy. On top of that, um, there is greater need for other funding sources. We have for the first time tapped into SRF loans, tens of millions of dollars of SRF loans, which we have not been able to do so before. We have also tapped into for the first time, EPA Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act funding, about $500 million potentially coming our way in city of San Diego to address a lot of these issues. So really for me, I think it boils down to um, getting an understanding and, and not looking at these projects just from a water supply or water quality, but looking at everything. And also it's cost avoidance because uh, doing these projects now is going to save a lot of funding in, 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 in the future. So. With that, I will move it on to the next speaker and happy to talk to you um, and address any more questions. Thanks, Chris. Our next panelist is Scott Norris with manager of the County of San Diego Stormwater Capture and Use Incentives Program. Scott, can you please give us a quick introduction into the stacked incentives and how do you help your stakeholders SCU project funding go further? Absolutely. 
Thanks. Um, and, and I'd like to start just a bit by talking about why stacked incentives make sense for us. Um, so as the County of San Diego Watershed Protection Program, our goal is to reach, um, it's, I'm sorry, it's to prevent pollutants from entering the storm drain system and receiving water in the first place. Uh, we also need to implement strategies in order to achieve our dry and wet weather goals. Um, we know that we have a partner in the San Diego County Water Authority who shares some similar needs. Uh, theirs are more about water supply, conservation, and water use efficiency. Um, but we can accomplish both of these through the use of BMP implementation, water saving implementation on private properties. And that's what we've done. So we reached out to Joni and her team. And over the past couple of years, we've been able to form a really solid partnership, but we're now stacking incentives on top of each other. What that means is we looked at the existing programs that um, the Metropolitan Water District and San Diego County Water Authority member agencies were administering and decided it was much more efficient for us to sweeten the pot, if you will, by adding additional funding to their already incentivized programs, um, then to go and create our whole new program. Um, and to really, this is primarily about education and getting the public's foot in the door. Uh, we like to call Rain Barrels the gateway BMP. Um, it helps people understand their connection to rainwater, stormwater, the storm drain system, right? What they can do to help manage rainwater, stormwater on their property. And so we start there. We start with rain barrels. We've expanded it to cisterns. We have weather-based irrigation controllers. We have turf removal. And we also have an ag efficiency program that we're partnering with them on. So by pooling our resources and having a single application site, rather than having to apply for multiple rebates from multiple agencies, we've really streamlined the process and been able to um, message this to our communities uh, where it's really necessary that, that they understand that connection. Um, a quick example, we worked together on a large HOA project here in the Rancho San Diego area, uh, replaced 37,000 square feet of unused turf uh, with low water use landscaping and a stormwater retention feature. Um, it's estimated that, that will save about $20,000 a year for that HOA and watering costs. Um, and 90% of that project cost was able to be incentivized through the existing incentives available through San Diego County Water Authority, Metropolitan Water District in the County of San Diego. Excellent. Thanks so much, Scott, for that information. Sounds like a fantastic strategy to streamline the process. Our next speaker is Joni German, coordinator for the San Diego County Water Authority Water Smart Program. Joni, what are some of your logistical challenges such as reaching and informing customers when you offer SCU incentives? And what are the practical solutions for overcoming barriers such as administrative burdens? Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, I just want to uh, kind of uh, add on to what Scott was saying about our partnership and how natural it is. Um, uh, the Water Authority obviously is the wholesale water provider for the region, and you know we've been uh, concerned about increasing uh, the, the reliability, reliability of local supplies. We've been diversifying our our supply portfolio. And I, we've become a more sustainable agency in that respect. So we're, we've gone beyond just looking at um, uh, reducing our dependence on imported supplies, but on you know, uh, expanding our supplies uh, within the region. And the first thing we tell homeowners, the first thing we tell you know, anyone we try to educate is that we don't have groundwater supplies. We don't get a lot of rain. We're, we are, have been importing water for many years. And, the droughts are going to continue. Summers are going to continue to get hotter. So uh, when we started uh, expanding our programs to include landscapes, uh, that's when we partnered with the county and realized we have many of the same goals. Mm -hmm. So we want people to save water by capturing rainwater, uh, either in storage devices or by sinking it into their soil. And the county and the stormwater agencies are looking to do the same thing, but with a different benefit. 
obviously the benefit of, of reducing stormwater runoff. So we realized that we had many of the same goals in common and some, some of the logistical um, issues that came up for the county was, well, how are you going to uh, uh, deliver incentives for rain barrels? How are you going to deliver incentives for turf rebates? The more we talked, the more we realized that the Water Authority has the infrastructure. We have the Metropolitan Water District and the rebates system that's available. The county has you know, funding that's available to uh, supplement these rebates. So that's how we've, um, but we've partnered not only on education programs, but on stacked incentive programs. Mm -hmm. And these are really great programs because not only are we saving water, and educating uh, our customers about saving water, but they're also protecting the, the, the storm drains and they're keeping water out of the storm drains, protecting water quality. And these multiple benefits are something that are, that are speaking to people on a, on a greater environmental level, on a, on a more biodiverse level. And that's something that we have found over the years that our, our customers want to hear more about. Um, as far as the challenges, uh, our challenges are keeping our curriculum, keeping our offerings, you know, up to date to make sure that consumers uh, and customers know that there are, there are programs out there for them. I mean, we found 10 years or so ago that we were really saturated in the indoor market. So we had replaced a lot of toilets and, and installed a lot of faucet aerators. And, and so that's when we started to look toward the la landscapes and irrigation devices and rain gardens and rain barrels and cisterns. And um, that's when the multi-benefits came in. Um, we're lucky because we're a wholesaler and we have 24 retail agencies and we are able to uh, contact our customers through those agencies. So that's very you know, beneficial to us. And that's something that the county um, has also been able to take advantage of. One thing I will say though, is the county represents 50% of the water authority service area. So we are also working with our other municipal incorporated stormwater agencies to, uh, to start uh, partnering on very similar programs. That's excellent. Thanks so much, Joni. Great information. Um, I'd like to ask everybody to post their questions in the chat. If you have any questions for our speakers, uh, we'll be taking a few and then uh, just to wrap up our session. And then we'll also be uh, including all the sessions, all the answers to the questions that we don't get to uh, and sending those out to the participants today. Okay, so with that, um, we've reached the, uh, the end of our program. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers again uh, it's for your great input, uh, for providing us a really informative morning. Um, I want to, um, uh, again, echo what Tamla just said about uh, your uh, questions that you may have, submitting those so that uh, we can uh, forward them on to various speakers and uh, ask them to respond to you. Uh, I just want to emphasize in closing that um, a stormwater capture and use is one important component of a, a comprehensive water future for the San Diego region. And we have uh, had programs in the past that have uh, focused on uh, conservation, on uh, potable reuse, uh, on um, uh, desal, on various aspects of uh, planning for our water future. And so this is right in line with that uh, series of conversations, which we're going to continue, hopefully, with um, not only more webinars, but in the not too distant future, hopefully in-person programs again. Um, the um, uh, Last thing I want to say is that uh, the contributions that all of our speakers and their various agencies and companies are making uh, to this area are, are really vital. And hopefully all of you who have uh, tuned into today's webinar 
uh, will come away with a new appreciation of, of all the good work that's being done and that you'll support that going forward uh, to make this uh, a really important new component of San Diego's water sustainability in the future. So with that, I wanna thank you very much uh, for being here and we look forward to seeing you again at future programs. Thanks, Carrie. Um, we did have one quick question, and I don't know, is uh, Trent Biggs still here? Is he still on the call? It looks like maybe he may have, uh, have dropped off. So um, we'll post the answers to his questions uh, for the speakers. Were there other, uh, were there other questions? been tracking the questions in the chat throughout the program. <laughs> and let's see if there was someone. Last chance to, to do a quick unmute if uh, somebody had a question related to any of these or if any of the panelists wanted to respond to something that was brought up. Good. I'll take this last question. Um, and I just unmuted myself. So I thought, well, maybe because I can see that Dave Gibson is here and our, our event sponsor, SDSU's Watershed Science Institute director, Trent Biggs, had a really great question for him. So if Trent is still here, which I can't see, um, we need to unmute him so he can ask his question. Um, but we had other great questions from uh, Bob Leiter for, uh, uh, let me see, I, I did forward those to you. Yeah, and if we just want to read off the questions, we'll have that captured mm -hmm. on the recording and then we can certainly pass that along. Um, yeah. Uh, the negative impacts of climate change on our watersheds uh, may require additional mitigation measures to meet water quality standards. So he, uh, Bob noted the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board and the MS4 permit co-permittees are currently reviewing and updating the, our Region 9's watershed management area quality improvement plans. And he wondered about those updates if, if either Dave or Stephanie or, or uh, Chris McFadden could, could um, answer, you know, how additional mitigation measures might keep our water quality uh, up to snuff during climate change. Certainly, that, that's really an important question, and we could literally spend a couple of days on that one, so I'll try not to. Uh, Stephanie and Chris will have a lot more to add. The, the Watershed Water Quality Improvement Plan concept was built into the municipal stormwater permit, the regional permit, in order to facilitate and enable and to compel municipalities to cooperate together on a watershed scale to identify best management practices that would be implemented to the maximum extent practicable. I'm adding the emphasis to those on a watershed scale and realize some efficiencies. Also to try to create a platform for innovation and for evaluation of the effectiveness of those measures in order to attain the receiving water quality objectives. A key component of that was to be able to prioritize a pollutant or constituent of concern rather than try to do 200 at once, do one or two really well. So for San Diego Bay, it's bacterial indicators, but it's also trash. Other watersheds, it's often bacterial indicators because we have had exceedances at beaches that, that do in fact threaten health and, and, and human environment con, con, uh, quality. The iterative process that the State Board established in 1998, 1999, we intended to really specify in terms of how this is um, practiced by the municipalities and to give them that adequate time to encourage uh, that innovation and, and application of best management practices, rather than rely on a rather unidirectional and static total maximum daily load process, which takes many years to promulgate and once it's in place, allows very little variation or iteration or, or, or innovation. 
Um, it is still very much an open question, and, and that will be a key part of the board's consideration of the regional permit later this year. Um, but it would address the climate change. It would, does allow the municipalities to address stormwater capture and harvest as one of several techniques to not only reduce pollutant loads, as seen at the San Diego airport, but also to make uh, supply available. So there's a broad range of options, but I wanna mention also the board identified an alternative compliance option, which would allow for really innovative projects to look at a watershed scale. They could range from source control BMPs, very conventional technology, perhaps invested in by multiple discharges from, new, from several areas at once but also all the way out to stream restoration or rehabilitation to try to provide more assimilative capacity at the other end of the equation. It's a very, very large subject, needless to say. So I have to really kind of cut it off there, but the process was intended to be iterative specifically because of several factors like climate change and changing hydrology. So I think we can leave it there and I hope that that stimulates further discussion in the permit consideration later this year and on the review and the feedback that the Water Board has provided. One last point, I really want to commend the City of San Diego, City of Escondido and County of San Diego for bringing up the San Diego Watershed Water Quality Improvement Plan to, to a much higher level than it was originally uh, submitted when I approved it back in 2015 or so. They've made significant improvements in response to the board's feedback and it's the kind of relationship we wanted to see when we deal with a very complex subject like stormwater. So my, my thanks to them for, for improving that product in, in place as we move forward on the permit reissuance. Dave, while you're still here, um, even though Trent Biggs, the director of the SDSU Watershed uh, Science Institute, isn't here, but he left you a question. It's a um, hard question. It's a hard <laughs> question. It, it, it's kind of uh, what how you think um, you know, stormwater capture can eventually pencil out. Yeah. Like, does mm -hmm. the increasing capacity to treat wastewater via pure water, for example, help yeah. make stormwater capture pencil out and perhaps even become competitive with desal? You know, uh, just uh, any thoughts you have? On yes, and, and I'll be succinct again because several speakers spoke to this earlier, especially Chris McFadden and Stephanie Gaines. Uh, one of the realities that we struggle with, we as a collective whole, regulators, municipalities, non-governmental organizations, environmental advocates, is the fact that stormwater is not funded as an enterprise fund as water and wastewater are. Water and wastewater agencies and organizations like the city of San Diego can rely upon fees. And you heard some very good commentary from Jack Monger why this is a complicated subject when we look at stormwater. But being able to couple a basically underfunded effort like stormwater capture for reuse or for pollution control to a well-funded, arguably, uh, enterprise fund like water and wastewater treatment is one way to make it pencil out and make it cost effective in terms of infrastructure costs. If you're building strictly a standalone stormwater BMP, your funding source is constrained and your ability to use that water on a large scale is constrained. So the cost affordability is, is low at best. Being able to do it on a larger scale and couple it with enterprise funded projects helps make it pencil out. I think the opportunities existed at San Diego State if that kind of innovation, and it pains me as an alumnus to, to criticize my alma mater. And I know that the intentions to provide an educational environment were superior, but I think that this was a tremendous important missed opportunity in terms of making a campus look as Dr. Henry Barbanel, our chair described it, what our future looks like in terms of renewable energy and renewable water supply and reuse. Besides not only capturing stormwater, to my knowledge, there's no recycled water use on that facility as well. We missed opportunities there, but we have opportunities yet to, to retrofit and to adapt as we go forward. So my invitation is there for San Diego State to work with us and others on how we can do that, even though they are well along in their construction on the stadium and other aspects of their project and understanding that you can't simply go back and tell the state architect you wanna redo things. There is an opportunity for us in a generational perspective to, to make adjustments and improvements there. And, and I think that hopefully my criticism will invite that conversation. Thanks, Dave. Are there other questions? Believe it or not, I mean, there, there are, uh, They've been answered, you know, directly mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. uh, so Jim Rasmus and uh, the EPA's Michael John have been talking 
about subjects for future talks. And so we'll definitely, uh, you know, apprise everyone uh, of that. And uh, I, I'm not sure I was trying to find Carol, because Carol's emphasis of the infrastructures bill, focus of, uh, you know, requirement of a 25% infrastructure work in disadvantaged communities was a really great opportunity and incentive. Um, and I wasn't sure if, uh, if we have a link to something like that, but that's a point to keep aware of in the future. Um, okay. Thank you. I see. And, uh, Joni, just raise your hand. Joni, did you want to address that question? Actually, or I wanted to address another question. <laughs> Sorry, but the question has to do with how we can um, keep this kind of collaboration going and how we can, as a region, you know, keep these conversations going. Mm -hmm. And um, what I've noticed is that so, some of our water agencies are, are water providers, solely water providers, but some of them are cities, some of them are municipal, municipalities. And with, obviously with the city of San Diego as the, ex, the exception, not the stormwater people aren't always talking to the water people and we can help each other. And the, the partnership that the Water Authority has with the County of San Diego is proof of that. So, um, you know, we have to find a way to, to keep this conversation going um, on a watershed level. And, you know, maybe um, Stephanie Gaines can, can speak to that a little bit. I, I keep looking at the, at the, to the San Diego IRWM as, as the, the model of, of what we can achieve when we work together. And I think, I think that group is a little more formalized. Um, you, you're reading my mind. I, I was literally <laughs> thinking, well, we have the IRWM forum, why not? And, you know, to be frank, we were just meeting yesterday to plan our next regional advisory committee meeting and meetings in the future. And we're looking for topics. And mm -hmm. this is a fantastic topic to bring back mm -hmm. and create a forum around. So let me know if, if I have full permission from everybody to take this back to the regional water management group and um, identify it as a future topic. Yeah, I think that would be a fantastic topic. I think stormwater is, is I think it's so misunderstood by the public. Um, I don't think that the public fully understands how much work is going on behind the scenes um, for stormwater capture uh, and, and reuse. So, yes. And I did want to mention real quick that we are uh, starting with Water Tech Alliance to do a face-to-face -face Zoom surveys with those who have solutions to provide um, that can incorporate both, you know, much more interactive discussion where we can actually have people get on camera and have breakout groups and whatnot combined with being able to meet with different types of solution providers and break that out into different Zoom rooms. There's a fantastic platform that we've been using that, that you know, some very large events have been able to use those very successfully. And, uh, and so we're excited to ha help support these discussions through those events. So if you see the, uh, we'll put it back in the chat at watercitizen.org slash stormwater survey and, and we'll be able to start talking to folks about how we can best support these conversations. Perfect. If I could just um, answer uh, the question that was asked about the report, it was um, the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act report that the Department of Government Affairs did at the um, City of San Diego's January 10th meeting. I can't remember if it was a land, like it might've been a, a committee meeting or it might've been something else. I mean, I'm trying to find it, track it down, um, but, Maybe Chris McFadden might actually know because she's at the city as well. She probably is aware of that report. But I have the PowerPoint that um, I downloaded off of the the uh, the docket. You know the the materials that are on. So January tenth, go look for those. <laughs> it's the um, it's the it's. And I'm trying to figure out if I can upload it to the chat, but it looks like I can't from my computer. Um, so I'll try to figure out how to do it, but it's the infrastructure department of government, government affairs, infrastructure, investment and jobs act report that, um, Thank you. that's, that's great. We can find that. Uh, we did have one more question for Chris McFadden, uh, cost avoidance is certainly an unsung benefit of stormwater capture projects. So great to see it being evaluated as a benefit. How significant as a factor do you believe it is? 
I yeah, so thanks for the question because not like I mentioned before, I just don't have to address just water quality. And we, and we have a watershed asset management plan that evaluates water quality needs as well as flood resiliency needs. And we're really uh, looking now, we're calling it green infrastructure and flood resiliency projects. Um, so we have a way of looking at uh, evaluating projects uh, in particular uh, for maintenance and not having to introduce this constant flow. You know, you go anywhere in, in the summer, there, a lot of these streams sh should be ephemeral. They're, they're constant. I mean, we have this constant over irrigation, let's face it. Um, it's coming from a lot of uh, not non-natural sources. And you can do as much education as possible, but the perfect example uh, is Serena Valley. And you go down there any time of day and it has a constant flow. And we can dredge that once and about 10 months later, the vegetation has almost entirely reestablished. And then you're having to potentially dredge it again. And really you're having that constant, um, that vegetation is being fed by the, the water, uh, the ir over irrigation that is constantly happening. So that's one of the main reasons we looked at that place in particular um, is because if you avoid uh, the, the introduction of water, not only are you avoiding pollutants um, and bacteria and everything else, uh, but you're reducing that non-natural flow. And, and as Dave mentioned, it, it's, it's turned what was a, stalt, a saltwater lagoon, Los Pen, into a, a freshwater lagoon because of this over-irrigation. Um, so the more you can shear off those flows, get it into a beneficial use, um, use that for, for pure water, um, and, and that's, you know, saves us from having to do unnecessary dredging, unnecessary environmental impact, and then reestablish that system into a saltwater system that should hopefully, if managed appropriately, never have to be touched again for maintenance and avoiding maintenance costs for that area entirely. Wow, perfect. Thanks, Chris. And I think we've come to the uh, end of our, our uh, scheduled webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers and panelists today. Amazing, amazing information. Uh, and I look forward to these conversations continuing and, uh, and, and where we can see uh, stormwater grow, stormwater capture grow in the future. Were there any other concluding remarks, Carrie? So just to uh, once again, thank everyone for attending and participating and uh, please um, stay tuned. We will be conducting other programs in the near future and hope to see you all again then. Thanks so much, everybody. Have thank a great you. afternoon. You too. Bye-bye.